And now, the moment that I'm sure you've all been waiting for, the President's Award for Lifetime Achievement. You know, I thought long and hard about who ought to get an award like this, whose life and accomplishments best reflected the everything the Overseas Press Club and myself personally stand for. You know, in, in 1968, um, a gentleman who's sitting right over there at the table, Seymour Topping, um, brought me to the New York Times as a young, fledgling news assistant, eventually a foreign correspondent, beginning my career. Um, Twelve years later, in the fall of 1980, when I left the Times to go to CBS, thank you, Leslie, um, was under the stewardship of um, Abe Rosenthal, himself a two-time OPC award winner. And at that same moment in 1980, tonight's President's Award recipient was a young reporter for the Congressional Quarterly Weekly Report, covering lobbyists and interest groups in Washington. But the career of tonight's honoree quickly ramped up from its humble, if distinguished, beginnings. Even earlier, he'd been at the Portland Oregonian, the Dallas Times Herald. He joined the Times in April of 1984 in Washington, and he rose rapidly through the ranks at home and overseas, from Moscow to Johannesburg, distinguishing himself as a foreign correspondent. And by July 2003, the Times, of course, as you may recall, was under siege from every possible quarter, and he assumed the leadership of executive editor. Since then, he's guided the Times through some pretty rocky shoals indeed, preserved the bedrock values it stands for, and that he's represented for his entire career. So I can imagine no worthy recipient for the 2011 Overseas Press Club President's Award than the New York Times' own Bill Keller. Let me read the citation first. Um, the President's Award to Bill Keller. In recognition of his brilliant career as a foreign correspondent and as executive editor, his stewardship of the New York Times to unparalleled successes through an era of profound transformation in the media industry. His imagination, courage, and determination in the face of challenges to the daily newspaper and its global coverage remain the standard for leadership in our profession. The integrity and judgment that have marked his career serve as an inspiration to us all. Bill, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I've been told I have 10 to 12 minutes. I, I promise I'll yield some of those minutes back. Um, it's late. You're tired. You're drunk. <laughs> if you're not drunk, shame on you. We have an open bar. Um, but at, you know, at least you can all sleep in tomorrow. I know you've been checking your blackberries and you all know now that the royal wedding has been canceled. <laughs> Apparently the news of the world broke the story by hacking into the Archbishop of Canterbury's cell phone. <clears throat> uh, anyway, I, I um, am inclined to be uh, skeptical and lighthearted about honors, but, uh, but I find this one actually moves me very much and I would like to thank the board. My wife's immediate reaction was that this is the kiss of death. I think her exact words were, you're a dead man walking. <clears throat> there is something about a Lifetime Achievement Award that falls between valedictory and obituary. <clears throat> and I, I like to think I still have a bit of lifetime left. Um, and then earlier this month, the New York Women in Communications gave their Lifetime Achievement Award to Betty White. Now my wife asks uh, if, if that made me the Betty White of American journalism. <clears throat> I assured her that Helen Thomas had that role locked up. <clears throat> uh, but, uh, but I am seriously honored and very grateful. I've done a fair number of jobs in this business, sort of high and low and foreign and domestic, uh, street and desk. Uh, but if I have to say where I feel most at home, it's with the tribe of foreign correspondents. Being a foreign correspondent is the best work in journalism, and yes, that includes my current job. Uh, it teaches you all sorts of life-enhancing skills, how to talk your way onto an overbooked airplane, uh, how to take the words of translators who learned their English watching SpongeBob cartoons and turn them into literate quotes, uh, how to survive for days on coffee and cigarettes. I guess nowadays it's Red Bull and Nicorette. Um, how to make it through a Chinese Party plenum, uh, Ch Chinese Communist Party plenum, or an overseas press club awards dinner <clears throat> without, a, without a bathroom break. 
Um, anyway, I'm delighted to spend an evening in the company of so many members of that tribe, and I congratulate all of the winners tonight. Your work in far-flung places reinforces my deep conviction that while aggregation is a wonderful thing, and I really sincerely mean that, <coughs> there is no substitute for boots on the ground. That, by the way, is as close as I intend to get tonight to the subject of Arianna Huffington. <coughs> um, I'm, I'm sorry to disappoint those of you who've been live blogging, and, uh, and I'm especially sorry to disappoint Arianna, who has overcome her publicity shyness to challenge me so far to five debates, a dance contest, a World Wrestling Federation smackdown, and a duel. <coughs> I also plan to avoid tonight the subject of Rupert Murdoch and Fox News. I think even the birthers are entitled to a network they can call their own. <clears throat> <clears throat> and although we are deeply thankful that the Times was cited by the OPC for our coverage of the war logs and diplomatic cables, and I'm very proud of that work, uh, I'm a little tapped out on the subject of Julian Assange. Julian is angry with me and my paper, but I think he's had ample revenge. It is apparently my fate to spend eternity appearing on panels discussing WikiLeaks. <clears throat> uh, I also do not intend to talk tonight about the business model for digital journalism. I'm a friend and great admirer of Alan Rusbridger, but I'm not in the mood right now to quarrel with his view that, as I understand it, we should all work for free. Uh, I will, however, be happy to hold his coat while he dukes it out with Lionel Barber of the FT who has the affrontery to argue that newspapers should make money. <clears throat> uh, and finally, in my list of non-topics, I do not intend to whine about the American retreat from foreign news coverage. We're all used to the conventional wisdom that these are dire times for foreign news. Uh, I've been hearing that at least since I was made foreign editor in 1995. And it's true that downsizing has been brutal, but this is not the occasion, and frankly, I'm not the guy since our foreign staff at the Times is as large as it's ever been. Uh, no, my thought for this evening is a brighter one, that this is in fact a glorious time for foreign reporting. What we have in North Africa, the Middle East, uh, Japan, Ivory Coast, to cite just the obvious highlights, is amazing, rich, consequential stories. The other day I was uh, chatting with Tom Friedman, who has been in this business upwards of 30 years, won three Pulitzers and four OPC awards, including this one uh, in 2004. And he declared that Tahrir Square was simply the most amazing story of his life. Now, I covered the end of the Soviet Union and the end of white rule in South Africa, and yet I believe that what we're witnessing now is in the same league. The Arab Spring, or if you count the buds of freedom in Iran, the Arab Persian Spring, is the kind of story that makes journalists say things like, I can't believe they pay me to do this. Not because of the euphoria in the streets or because we're confident that something better is in store for these countries. It's thrilling because these are big, complicated, unpredictable events demanding attention, investigation, and explanation. In other words, demanding journalism. Covering these stories may not be as fun as it was in the days before sat phones and web updates when you could actually get off the grid, stay there for a while, and absorb at least a crude understanding of a situation before you were obliged to file on it. And as we've already acknowledged tonight, the job is often perilous. I spent a few hours Monday at Walter Reed Hospital with Joao Silva, who lost his legs, as you all know, to a landmine last October while embedded with an American patrol near Kandahar, and who is now learning to walk on artificial limbs and fighting off waves of infection. We spent much of that time, way too much of that time, talking about colleagues and friends who've been detained or assaulted or killed in Egypt, Libya, Syria, including, of course, Tim Hetherington, who is tragically not with us tonight, and Lindsay Adario, who is here tonight wearing her National Geographic hat. And we should not let this evening pass without paying tribute to those who risk their lives in crucial supporting roles, the stringers, fixers, translators, drivers. Because they lack the protection of money or a visa to somewhere else, they are the most vulnerable of all. The Times has had three of our local colleagues killed on my watch, two in Iraq, one in Afghanistan, and we still have a driver missing in Libya. But there are also enormous, happy consequences to stories of this magnitude. What happens when a Mubarak falls or a Japanese nuclear reactor goes wild is that readers flock to the news organizations that cover the news. Web traffic spikes, 
newsstand sales improve, viewers switch from the real housewives to real life. Institutions that have stinted on foreign bureaus scramble to find reporters who remember how to get a visa and even, wonder of wonders, speak a foreign language. Enterprising freelancers and startups like Global Post find they are in demand and some careers get launched. New media gurus who imagined that social media could be a substitute for professional journalism are shown that while Twitter and YouTube can give you glances of history, there's a limited value to crowdsourcing a revolution. And maybe, <laughs> and maybe, just maybe, foreign reporting moves up the priority lists of the people who make resource decisions, and maybe it stays there. At least that's my hope. I've always believed that the salvation of quality journalism, the kind of work being honored tonight, lies in the law of supply and demand. The demand for what we do, the hunger for it, the need for it, measured in those millions of page views, has never been greater. In my next lifetime, I look forward to seeing the supply replenished to meet that demand. Thank you very much. Thank you.